Good morning. How are we doing? Can you hear me? I can't hear me. Can you? Oh, there I am. Now I can hear me. If I can hear me, that means you can hear me. Um, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible. And uh, just to add on to that welcome of Clay's, if you're visiting with us, we are glad that you're here and uh, excited that you would spend part of your Sunday morning with us. If you're new, maybe you are new to town and you're looking for a church, I would just tell you you're around some of the best people in all of East Texas. And so we're glad, yeah, woohoo. And so we're glad, <laughs> we're glad that you're here. Um, and after the service, if we haven't met yet, I'd love to meet you. Most Sundays I'm standing out in the lobby right after the service. Uh, so come by and introduce yourself and say hi. Um, also, uh, just a couple of things. If you weren't here last Sunday, you missed our congregational meeting. It was last Sunday afternoon. If you weren't here, first, I need to apologize to you because I, I had um, made the decision that we would start recording our congregational meetings and then making those available to, to folks that couldn't be there, that were traveling out of town and that sort of thing. And, uh, and I just dropped the ball on that last Sunday. And so I wish there was somebody I could blame it on besides me. But the truth is, is I failed to make the arrangements with our streaming team to have someone here to stream it. And so you missed it. Sorry about that. I, I would tell you, um, probably maybe the most important thing that we talked about that day, we just gave a lot of ministry updates. But the one that will impact most of us is that we're going to make some changes to the way that we receive our offering every week, starting on November 3rd. Um, we, we ran a bunch of statistics. And basically, at the end of the day, most of you who call... Now, Fellowship Bible Church, your home church, and support us financially with your tithes and your offerings. Do that online. Uh, we live in a digital age, and so well over 70% of uh, giving in this church comes in online. Very few of it comes in uh, during the service. In fact, we collect on average, we looked at an entire year, and on average we collect about 14 or 15 checks. Uh, each week. That's about it. And so you got 400 people in the room, uh, less than 5% of you, uh, roughly, or 8% are participating in that part of the service. And so uh, we're just going to eliminate that, at least the moment where ushers come forward and we pass baskets. What we're doing instead is, and you can see them, they're already here, is we have what we call faith boxes in the back of the room, and there's one at each one of the entry exits. And so there's three of them right inside the worship center here. And so as you're exiting today, you'll see them there. Uh, and beginning November the 3rd, uh, we still will talk about, uh, 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 we'll still have an offering moment in the service because it is an act of worship. Uh, we just won't have our ushers come forward and we just won't pass baskets anymore. So that's probably the biggest thing that you miss. Between now and then, uh, we still will have our usher teams for the next three weeks and the faith boxes. And so if you want to get used to using the faith box, you can, but if not, don't worry. Uh, ushers are here, and then starting Sunday, November the 3rd, uh, they'll, they'll, we won't have ushers doing that part of the service anymore. They will, however, uh, help us with communion, which is awesome. Uh, and so anyway, that's probably the biggest thing that I can tell you. Also, if you weren't here last Wednesday night for our worship and prayer night, it was an incredible night. Uh, I don't know how you judge such things, but we just had a good time for about an hour uh, in the Lord, just singing and praying and praying for one another, intercessory prayer and praying for uh, area churches and uh, all kinds of stuff. And so I just want to thank Kristen and the worship team for providing an incredible uh, night of worship. And yeah, and we will uh, definitely do that again, I think, at some point. We headed into it not knowing um, what to expect and what the Lord would do, but I, I think that uh, he was honored that night. And so we'll do that again at, at some point in the future. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can grab them and turn with me to James chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I know it's a little early to start talking about this because it's not even Halloween or Thanksgiving yet, but I want you to think with me real quick about your favorite Christmas movie. What's your favorite Christmas movie? Just think, think about that for a second. Uh, I have several, and it's hard to choose just one, right? It's kind of like for those of you who have kids, it's like, well, what's your favorite child? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't have a favorite child. They're all my favorite children. And so with Christmas movies, I sort of feel like it's the same way. And then for those of you men sitting out there going, well, it's Die Hard. No, it's not. Die Hard's not a, <laughs> Die Hard's not a Christmas movie. We're going to settle that debate today. Okay, that movie is an action movie that takes place during Christmas, not a Christmas movie. Take that off your list. Um, it's a true story. There is always a, like a cultural debate of whether or not that's a Christmas movie. It's not. Um, 
<clears throat> not that I have the final say on what's a Christmas movie or not. Anyway, I digress. One of my favorites is the movie Elf. Um, yeah, if you're familiar with this, this is a, a movie about Will Ferrell who plays a, a guy named Buddy the Elf. And if you haven't seen the movie, kind of what you need to know is when Buddy was a young child, he was living in an orphanage and he uh, stows away in Santa's sack. So Santa, the real Santa Claus from the North Pole, comes and visits the orphanage. And Buddy, when he's a little kid, uh, hops into uh, Santa's toy pack sack, gets on the sleigh, and ends up back at the North Pole, and where he is raised um, by Santa's elves. And uh, so it's a hilarious story, and, and it becomes evident as he continues to grow because Buddy uh, ends up being like, you know, six and a half feet tall, and all these little elves are little, and so there's some funny stuff that it happens there. But, but as he grows up, he becomes an adult. Um, he goes to New York City in search of his birth father. Santa gives him his blessing and says, yes, you can go to New York City. And so Buddy heads out uh, for New York City to find his birth father. And uh, I can't t t give it all away or tell you the whole movie. But at one point, uh, Buddy ends up in a department store in search of his uh, real father. And while he's there, like most department stores do, um, they have a, a Santa display. And so Santa's there, right? You can take pictures and you bring your little kids and moms and dads, you know, get pictures with Santa. That whole thing's happening at this department store. That's kind of the scene that you see behind me. And, uh, and so we know about that. But, but when Buddy is in the department store, he sees Santa from across the department store and he's really excited because he knows the real Santa. And he thinks that the real Santa that he knows that helped raise him in the North Pole is actually in the department store. And so he's super excited. He makes his way across the department store. And as he's getting closer and closer um, to this Santa Claus, Buddy realizes this is not Santa Claus. This is not the real uh, Santa Claus. And so he's kind of confused. And at one point, he's like, you're not Santa. You don't even smell like him. You smell like beef and cheese. And so you have to see the movie uh, to really appreciate that and Will Ferrell's humor. Um, but here's the question that I have for us. Uh, what, what is it that Buddy's trying to show us in this scene? And that is this scene, by the way. He's confronting his Santa and ripping his beard off. So, so what Buddy's trying to show us is, is that he knows what the genuine article is. That he knows what the real deal is. He knows the real Santa and this is not the real Santa. And that's what I believe James is after today in our passage. It has nothing to do with Santa Claus. Uh, but he's going to show us in a manner of speaking whether or not you have a counterfeit faith or you have a real authentic faith. And so if you have your Bible or your James journal, we're in James chapter 2, and we're just going to pick up where we left off last week in verse 14. We stopped in verse 13, so let's read verse 14. James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? Now, <clears throat> we're just going to pause right there because some of you from the very beginning here, right from the start, there's a little confusion because you're thinking, hold up, wait a minute, uh, that is not what the Apostle Paul says about faith. In fact, that's not what I was taught growing up. In fact, if you've grown up in church, you're probably more familiar with the passage uh, that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, where he says this, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. And so if you're paying attention to these um, two different passages, one from James, one from Paul, you should be feeling the tension between faith and works right now. And at first glance, these two passages from these two different men seem to be in conflict with one another. James is saying, hey, if you have faith, show me your works. And, and Paul's saying a little bit of the opposite. He's like, hey, works aren't necessary for faith. So what's going on here? We need to camp out here for just a minute. This message of salvation and grace 
is taught, is prevalent all throughout the New Testament. In a nutshell, that message is this. The wages of sin is death, and, and since we're all sinners, okay, since we're all sinners, we have an, incurred a death sentence. But God loves us, and he doesn't want us to spend eternity separated from him, and so he sent his son Jesus um, to pay the price for our death sentence. And so Jesus takes that sin, he takes our shame, he takes it upon himself at the cross, and if we believe that, if we make that our confession, if we make that our profession of faith, then the Bible says, God sin, says, that our sins are erased, the slate's wiped clean, and, and we can have a new life, we become a new creation in him. And so based on that, we understand that salvation is entirely God's work. God does the work, and it's none of ours, right? Nothing we can do can save us. I used to have a pastor that would say it this way. Um, this is when we were living in Austin, um, and he would say, it doesn't matter how many little old ladies you help across the street, right? That, that was just kind of his, his way of saying, hey, it doesn't matter how many good, because that's a good thing. By the way, if you, you should help people across the street, but you can't do that enough to save you. Saving faith, salvation, comes only by God's grace. It's his gift. And so getting back to the tension, we need to ask ourselves the question, why then does James seem to emphasize this issue of works and then Paul why does he tend to de-emphasize it, right? Who's right, Paul or James? Well, honestly, and I, this, is not, I'm trying, this is not a cop-out. I'm not trying to take the easy way out. Um, I honestly um, don't think they're in conflict with one another. I think James's message is simply, uh, you weren't saved by works. You were saved by faith. Uh, and then there's this, this big but there, and it's this. But if you have faith that saves, it will, or at least should, manifests itself in some works, that, that there will be some good things that uh, occur as a result of that faith. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe uh, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength that God raised him from the dead, then that will naturally affect who you are and what you do and how you live. Th this is the subject that James has brought up for our consideration today. And in the verses following this, he discusses what I will call at least three different types of faith. So for those that are taking notes, there's three different types of faith. The first type of faith that he talks about here um, is a, a counterfeit faith or what I'll call a dead faith. Okay, a dead faith. Let's look at this, verse 15. He says, if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food... And one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by works. Okay. Counterfeit faith, dead faith. Let me tell you what I think James is implying here. Uh, becoming a Christ follower should have an impact on your heart. The Bible says that when you come to, to truly believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you come into saving faith, you become a new creation. You become a different person. And just like last week, what James does here in this passage is he gives us a case study. And that's what I love about James. He's so practical. So he'll say something and he'll just give us a little example, a little story. And in this one, he says that when you see someone in need, you can no longer turn away from them because the Spirit of God lives in you. And because God cares deeply for everyone, he is a compassionate God, he loves everyone, and you have the Spirit of God living in you, if you truly have faith in Jesus, then God, by way of the Holy Spirit, is prompting you to be his hands, his feet, his mouth, his conduit of love to other people. That's what James is saying. 
And so here's another question that we have to answer. You have to answer. Has that change occurred in you? Has that change occurred in your life? More specifically, does your faith cause you to be compassionate toward other people? Are you looking to meet the needs of others? What do you think James would say uh, if we had responded to the gospel, prayed to receive Jesus Christ? He comes to town. We're at the church of Jerusalem where he's pastor, and we're like, yes, yes, absolutely. I've given my life to Christ. I prayed a prayer and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and yet, we continue to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, and we look down our nose at people in distress. What do you think James would say to that? What if we continued to have no heart for the homeless, no compassion for the poor? It, here's what James would say. He would say, you don't have true faith because there is no evidence in your life that shows that your faith is real. In fact, he's going to end this passage in just a few minutes by saying faith without works is dead. He would say you have a dead faith. This is in part... Why? We have things like Friendsgiving. This is why when we hired Toby Palmer a year ago, in addition to being director of students, we asked him to be our director of local missions, and he formed a local missions team, and they're forming local partnerships, and, and our faith should spur us into action. I mean, if you can't make it to Friendsgiving, you get a pass, but if you're not using the love and compassion that is in your heart that comes via the Spirit of God toward other people, then I think you're missing the boat. That's what James would say. And so he would say a dead faith is a faith that shows no evidence of faith. The second type of faith James discusses is what I'll call a disingenuous faith. Disingenuous. Look at verse 19. He says, you believe that God is one, good. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. Senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? So, so when a person who calls himself a Christian and um, is not living a, a righteous, virtuous, ethical life, here's, here's what they often end up doing. They cling to this false idea of, well, at least I believe in God. At least I believe in God. And because I believe in God, um, I, I'm not as bad as most of the rest of the people in the world. But listen to me, it's not enough just to believe in God. And herein lies the tension. It requires more than just belief. If that were enough, if belief were enough, then all the demons would go to heaven also because James says even the demons believe in God. In fact, Jesus one time encountered some demons. Let, let me show this to you. This is Luke chapter 4 says this, Jesus is in the synagogue. He's in church. That's awesome. Jesus is in church. There was a man with an unclean demonic spirit who cried out with a loud voice. And so this demon, begin, demons, plural, begin to speak to Jesus through this man. And the demons say, leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? So they even know who he is. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be silent and come out of him. And throwing him down before them, the demon came out of him without hurting him at all. Okay, notice that Jesus doesn't say to the demon or demons here, uh, Since you believe in me, since you believe that I am real, since that you believe that I exist, surely you will be in heaven with me today. Hey, Mr. Demon, um, I'm going to build a house with lots and lots of room. And guess what? There's going to be one for you also. That's not what he says, does he? 
Church, hear me. If today you say, I believe in God, and that's enough to get me into heaven, it's not. Here's what it's about. It's not that you believe, it's what you believe. Do you believe? Because you must believe this, that Jesus paid the price for your sin on the cross. That he purchased you with his own blood. That it's no longer you that lives, but Christ lives in you, that you're a new creation, and that he's given you a mission to impact this world for good. I'm not trying to cause any confusion in your life, but if we truly believe these things, they will be evident and obvious in our lives. If it's not obvious, if it's not evident, then then we need to honestly assess the situation for ourselves, okay? This isn't about someone else at this point. One of the things that we love to do is we like to put other people to the test, (laughs) whether or not they have enough faith. This isn't about anyone else. This is for you to do a self-assessment of your own life. Is it evident and obvious in my life? If not, you need to assess that. Whether or not you've truly come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul would state it another way. If you have genuine faith, there will be fruit in your life. He called it the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Like These things will be evident in your life. A life committed to Christ will bear that kind of fruit. It will be evident and obvious. And so a disingenuous faith is a faith where our words speak of faith, but our actions simply don't back it up. And then the third type of faith, because he's not one to leave us hanging here, is what I'll call a devoted faith, right? It's not dead faith. It's not disingenuous. It's full-on devotion to God. And James gives us two examples here Uh, in the Bible, um, who displayed uh, about two different people who displayed their devotion uh, to God and, 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 and people who believed in exactly what they did. His first example is Abraham's offering of Isaac. So let's take a look at this. Verse 21, he says this. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see, that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see, that person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So this story... It's told to us in Genesis chapter uh, 22, and uh, we studied that when we studied the book of Genesis. And so you might remember this story. God tested Abraham by saying to him, hey, I want you to take your only son. And and we know it wasn't his only son, right? He had another son. I'm not going to unpack all of that. This is really his second son. but, But it was the son that Scripture says, the son that you love. And so I want you to take Isaac, and I want you uh, to take him to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him there. And, and so Abraham, being a man of faith, takes Isaac, and, and you can read about the story in Genesis chapter 22, but he, he loads up everything he needs to build an offer, uh, altar, uh, heads out, it says, with a, a couple of, of servants. And so it's Abraham and Isaac and two servants, and they head out. It's a three-day journey. They get to Mount Moriah. They camp out for the night, wake up in the morning. And they get ready to, to head out. Um, Abraham's getting ready to sacrifice his son. His son, Isaac, doesn't know this at the time. In fact, when they're heading out, uh, the son speaks up and says, Dad, where, where's the sacrifice? He, he turns to the servants, Abraham does, and says, don't worry, we'll be back. And so they head out, father and son, and they get there and they build an altar and there's still no sacrifice. And And just like in a heart-wrenching sort of way, they build this altar, and then Abraham takes his own son, who's probably, you know, at least 10, 11, 12, maybe even a young teenager, takes him, and he ties him to the altar. And and, and I just feel like, 
Now, in the story, it, it gets like all the way, we don't know this for sure, but in my mind's eye, it's like all the way to the point where he raises the knife. Like he's getting ready. Abraham is getting ready to do exactly what God's asked him to do, and then he stops because God cries out and says, stop. I know now that I can trust you, and he provides the ram in the thicket. He provides the sacrifice. It's, again, just incredible story. You should read it this afternoon. And I think what James is getting at by bringing up that story is this. What if Abraham would have said, I have faith but not works? Like, faith is not just what we believe internally. It's how we behave externally. In other words, Abraham proved his devotion to God through his actions. He knew one of two things was going to happen. That either God would, 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 would stop him or he's going to provide the sacrifice. Or, listen, if he followed through with what God was asking him to do, that, that he would just raise his son. That there would be a resurrection. But either way, he trusts God implicitly. And so he's going to follow through on his faith. James' second example is found in the um, account of Rahab. Take a look at this, verse 25. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So Rahab's story we find in Joshua chapter 2. And there we read that, that God was leading the Israelites, the children of Israel, into the promised land and um, and there was a city in their way between where they were and where they needed to be, and that city was Jericho. And they needed to conquer Jericho to get to uh, the promised land. And so at this point, Joshua was taken over uh, for Moses. He's now the new leader of the Israelites. And being a good leader, he's like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a couple of spies into the land. So Joshua sends a couple of spies into Jericho. Uh, to scope out the city. And these two spies uh, end up at the house of a lady named Rahab. And Rahab's a prostitute. And like many women of that day in her trade, she also ran a boarding house. And, and so they're speaking with her, but word has gotten to the city leaders that there are some spies in the city. And, and so they send out their own troops trying to find these two spies. It's like a movie. It's incredible. And so the king's men are out, and they're knocking on doors, and they're trying to find these spies, and they come by Rahab's house, and, and, uh, and, and she's like, no, uh, I mean, they were here. Uh, they're not here right now, but they were here. In fact, they've left the city, and you've already shut the gates to the city. They're gone, but that is not the truth. She lied. What had she done? She'd store them up on the roof for safekeeping so they wouldn't be caught. It's an incredible story. And here's what she says, in essence. After the king's men leave, she turns to these two Jewish spies, and she's like, hey, I've heard all that the Lord has done for you Israelites. God has wiped out your enemies at every turn. I want to be on your side. I want to be on your team. And so they instruct her, okay, hey, we're coming to invade the city. Take this scarlet thread, tie it on your window, and that way when we come to invade the city, we won't harm anybody inside your house. And so what Rahab had, has done here, she's endangered herself by helping God's people escape. She's identified with God's people. She's changed. And she served God's people and God's purposes. She didn't just say, hey, I trust the Lord. Good luck getting out of town. She said, I'm here to help because God loves me. I love you guys because God served me. I want to serve you guys because God's delivered me from this mess I'm in. I want to help deliver you guys from the mess that you're in. It's God's work in me and through me and, and, and everything, and it's for you, and it's for him, and it's for your benefit. And so if I could just summarize it, like it's internal devotion, a devoted faith is internal devotion to God, which is faith, produces external devotion to God, which is works, because a good tree bears good fruit. 
And so the question before each of us this morning is, what type of faith are you? Do you have a dead faith? Do you have a a disingenuous faith? Or do you have a devoted faith? And if you're here today and you would say, you're not a Christian, but you're a religious person, and you think, you know, I'm a religious person, and, and therefore I'm a good person, I'm a moral person, and again, you're the one that would say, you know, I, yeah, yes, I believe, and I'm not as bad as the other people in the world. I just want to tell you that, that you're not as good as you think you are, that you're a sinful person, because the Bible tells us that none are righteous. And there's nothing you can do to save yourself and to please God. Again, you just, there's not enough little old ladies to help across the street. And so whatever it is that you're doing in an attempt to appease God and try to please him, I I, I would just tell you to stop doing that and start trusting in what he's done for you through Jesus. And if you're here today, and you're a Christian, I would tell you that God has prepared good works for you to do. There are people for you to love. There are people for you to tell about Jesus. There are ways for you to grow. There are desires in your heart that need to be changed. There's generosity for you to share, and there is a mission for you to be on in this community. And Jesus invites you and I to join him in this wonderful, glorious, good works of the gospel, moving through the nations of the earth, starting in the lives of his people. And so may we here at Fellowship Bible Church, may we be a people who accept the invitation to work with him because he loves us. And he wants us to love what he loves and see who he is and to do what he does. Amen.